Welcome to Astronomy 103. In this section, we will start to discuss the solar system. So begin, let's talk about the inventory of the solar system. So a solar system consists of the sun and everything in orbit around it. Nearly all the mass in the solar system is in the sun. 99.8% of the mass of the solar system rests in the sun. The rest of it is mainly in Jupiter. Nearly all the rest of the mass is in planets and moons. Right, so the rest of the stuff, other than the planets and moons, are plutoids, so b balls of ice and rock in the Kuiper belt, asteroids, rocky piles that mostly sit between Mars and Jupiter, comets, which are essentially piles of ice and rocks, and meteoroids, pebbles from comets that got ejected when comets came close to the sun, or fragments of asteroids. Right, the planets uh, orbit the sun from west to east along the plane of the ecliptic. So you look down from the Earth's north pole. The planets orbit counterclockwise. The orbits are nearly circular, right? So it's true, Kepler did say that they're ellipses, and they are, but they're nearly perfect circles, right? Nearly. So that's why the observation by the observations by Tycho and, and was needed, you know, for Kepler to deduce that in fact they were in perfect circles. They were actually um, uh, uh, ellipses. Nearly all of them are in the same plane. Right, without Pluto, they're perfect about 1%. All right, um, the inner planets are called the terrestrial planets, and the outer planets are called the Jovian planets. By the same plane, means they all sit in one simple flat surface to within the accuracy of 1%. Quite remarkable. Here's the planets of the solar system. So, planets vary a bit by size. So, Jupiter is about a tenth the diameter of the Sun, and Earth is about a tenth the diameter of Jupiter, which means the Sun is 100 times that size of the Earth. So let's talk about terrestrial planets. So terrestrial planets tend to be close to the sun. They're rocky, so rocks are essentially silicon and iron. They tend to be high density, roughly about five grams per cubic me cubic centimeter, and they tend to be about small, and most maybe about ten thousand kilometers in diameter. While the terrestrial planets, Earth is the largest terrestrial planet. Jovian planets, on the other hand, are further from the sun. They're not made of rocks mainly. In fact, they're mostly made of gases, hydrogen, helium, methane, water, ammonia. Because they're made of gases, they have much lower density, maybe about one gram per cubic centimeter. And they're really large, so about 100,000 kilometers, 100, kilometers in diameter, about 10 times the size of the terrestrial planets. So here's a comparison of terrestrial and jo Jovian planets. Terrestrial planets to be close to the sun, Jovian planets to be far away. Terrestrial planets tend to be made of rocks and iron. Jovian planets tend to be made of gases. The mass of the terrestrial planets tend to be Earth-ish or so. Jovian planets are larger. The radii of the terrestrial planets tend to be, Earth is a good representative of radius, 10,000 kilometers. Jovian planets tend to be larger, roughly about 10 times larger. The densities of terrestrial planets are high because they're made of rocks. The jo density of Jovian planets are low because they're made of gases. The spin of terrestrial planets are slow. So Earth has a 24-hour spin. Mars has roughly a 24-hour spin. Venus has a much, very, very slow spin, and so does Mercury. Jovian planets tend to be fast rotators. Like, for instance, Jupiter only has a 10-hour um, uh, day or so. Uh, terrestrial planets have very few moons, right? So Earth has one, Mars has two. The Jovian planets tend to have many moons. Like Jupiter itself might have more than, more, more than 20. Okay, so let's talk about density. The density of an object is the mass by the volume. All right, so here's some common dense materials. Water is 1,000 kilometers per meter cube, or 1 gram per cubic centimeter. Metals tend to be 5,000 kilograms per meter cube, or roughly about 5 grams per cubic centimeter. So for objects like the Sun, J Jupiter, Saturn, its density is roughly that water, about 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. For terrestrial planets like Earth, Mercury, Moon, its density tends to be close to 5,000 because it's made of rocks, which are close to the density of metal. Right. So one important thing to under, is to understand the history of the solar system. Right. Um, however, one problem is that uh, large bodies like planets evolve. So it's, for instance, basically, the Earth has plate tectonics or volcanoes, and the surfaces of these planets get renewed. So in order to understand these things, right, we have to look. At, you get a better record by looking at small bodies that don't evolve. Basically, they're formed in the very beginning, and then they basically stay that way. So the small bodies that have best clues tend to be asteroids, comets, meteoroids, which comes from asteroids, and plutoids.
All right, let's talk about asteroids first. So, uh, rocky, so asteroids are rocky balance bodies that are bounded by gravity, right? Um, they're so they're, but they're small. Most of them live in the belt between Mars and Jupiter, about roughly about three or two point eight AU, called the asteroid belt. So about hundred thousand rocky objects bigger than one kilometer exists out there. Off the um, asteroid's asteroid belt, Ceres is the largest asteroid with a diameter of about a thousand kilometers or so, roughly tenth a tenth of Earth the size of the Earth. And a few thousand of these asteroids have orbits that cross the Earth orbit. So these are what are called near Earth asteroids. Okay. And some are near Jupiter, um, some are six degrees ahead of Jupiter, and some are six degrees behind Jupiter. And these are called Trojans, right? Right, basically the guards of Jupiter. Alright, so there's the Trojans. Um, you can see the Trojans are right here. There's Jupiter, and the Trojans right here. These are Greeks, for instance, right? Okay. There's the asteroid belt, right? And some of these near Earth asteroids are the ones that basically pass close to the Earth at some point. Uh, asteroids are faint because they're very small, but you can differentiate them from stars because they move. So if you take a long exposure on the camera, they basically appear as streaks of light in the sky. Right? This is after many, many hours, not basically after a few minutes. You don't have to tell where they are because they usually have hours pointed at them. All right, so these are asteroids. So uh, again, basically they're streaks of light because they move. Right. Uh, composition is not well known, uh, but they believe that most, some of them have iron cores or, or rocky with icy exteriors or maybe rocky all the way. Okay. Um, some of these are dark and have lots of water ices and organic material on the surface. These are known as the carbonaceous uh, asteroids. Uh, others are more reflective and mainly bare rock. These are known as silicate asteroids, so these are silicon. And some of them are actually iron asteroids as well. Right. Total amount of mass in asteroids is about the mass of the moon. So it's not a huge amount of mass in all together. Right. So here's a close up of the asteroids taken by Galileo spacecraft in nineteen ninety one and a near spacecraft in nineteen ninety seven. Okay. There's Ida and its moon Daki. Daki is about one kilometer across. Right. So more asteroid properties. So um if you measure the density, you can measure the density from passing spacecraft. So for Galileo, Space Pro and Near, the near Earth asteroid rendezvous, gave asteroid density is about a thousand to three thousand kilometers per cubic a meter. So this is somewhere between the density of water and um, iron. So that may be rocky but with huge voids in them. So that means these objects are rocky but they have might have huge holes in them basically which are empty. Alright, so this stuff might be important if you ever want to stop a killer asteroid, right? Because it has huge holes in it. Uh, you might want to think about different ways of of of, of stopping it than let's say sending a nuclear bomb to it. So here's basically a picture from near Shoemaker. So Shoemaker was actually sent to this asteroid, um, and the, the probe actually crashed into it in order basically for the orbiting, other orbiting spacecraft to basically examine some stuff that gets thrown out. Okay. Let's talk about comets. Now, comets are icy bodies, also called dirty snowballs. They're made of rocks, water ice, frozen methane, frozen ammonia, and frozen carbon dioxide. They tend to be at 1 to 10 kilometers in size or so. When they pass close to the sun, the ice is sublimate, so they basically evaporate, solids become the gas, and they blow a halo of gas around it with some rocks, pebbles, and this is called a coma, the, the, the stuff that actually makes the comet actually visible. Uh, the sunlight and solar wind push on the gas, and thus blowing the tail away from the sun. So the comet's tail is always point away from the sun, not opposite direction of motion, it's not like streamers. If you're walking through a windy day or you're walking through something windy, actually it's because it's pushed away from the sun. Okay, so the comet is considered the nucleus, the main solid body of the comet, and the coma, which is a diffuse halo of gas and dust around it. Tends to be very low density, about um, 100 kilograms per uh, meter cube. So this is actually less than water, so it's not solid water. The way you think about it, it's like a loosely packed snowball, right? So lots of empty spaces between them, mostly empty spaces, in fact. The orbit is typically about a thousand years or so, and they orbit far beyond the orbit of Pluto in something called the Oort Cloud. And there are also shorter period comets that origin in the region near Pluto, known as the, known as the Kuiper Belt. All right. So the camera Hale Bob from March 1997. It's very one of the most brilliant um, uh, comets that passed by Earth in recent memory. Okay, and so here you see there's a beautiful um, let me just get this thing here. There's a nucleus, there's a coma around it, and there is a tail, there's a dust tail and ion tail, associated with it. Right. 
And the comet tail is always point away from it due to the solar wind and light from the sun. So basically, this is the dust tail. That's the iron tail, right? The iron tail basically gets streamed out basically by the um, by the uh, solar wind, whereas the um, uh, dust tail is basically pushed by sunlight. Okay. So this is the comet Hartley two, showing the plumes and material from the impact spacecraft. All right. That's Halley's comet. The last picture taken in 1986. All right. It's about 10 kilometers across. All right, let's talk about meteoroids. Uh, meteoroids are small rocks or pebbles in the solar system. Uh, when they enter the Earth's atmosphere, they will burn up. And these are called meteors. So the associated meteor showers is when the Earth goes through the orbit of a comet. And so there's all this like dust from previous um, comet passages that sit there. And as the Earth goes through it, some of this dust basically hits the Earth's sample atmosphere, i.e. meteoroids, and they burn up creating meteors. Uh, meteorites are meteors that penetrate through the atmosphere and hit the ground. And these probably come from collisions between asteroids because you need something that's typically a lot denser than the puffy stuff that you get from comets. Uh, most meteorites are rocky, so 95% of them are rocky. Okay? Uh, the rest of them are iron, for instance. Like, this is like a core of an asteroid, for instance. Okay? The rarest of these are carbonaceous chondrules. All right? So these are basically lots of carbon in hydrocarbons, kind of like a rocky lump of coal or something like that. That's the way to think about it. Right. And occasionally you get really big um things that come there. So we're in the Behringer crater, so one kilometer across in Arizona. A fifty meter a fifty meter iron meteor landed about fifty thousand years ago, basically creating this giant explosion. Uh there's another one, uh the Solberry Basin in Canada, right? This formed from impact of a ten mile diameter asteroid one point eight billion years, so much longer ago. Right. Um, so this asteroid came in, it smashed into it. This area, the Solberry Basin, is, uh, is a big mining area. So it's ex the area is extremely rich in mineral, especially iron. So when people talk about mining asteroids, well, I mean, Canada has been doing it for like uh, over 100 years now, right? So you have to wait till the asteroid basically hits the Earth. Um, there are also basically um, impacts that can happen, all right? Um, we haven't had impact like the one in Arizona or the one that created Solberg in a really long time, right? But we have had other basically um, uh, explosions from the result of basically impacts. So the f uh, famous one was the Tunguska explosion, 1908, right? So no one's actually around to see the explosion, right? But it resulted from a 30 meter, 30 meter, 30 meter, a meter, a meter, which exploded above the ground. Uh, and explode with a power of about 10, 10 megaton nuclear bomb. Now, unfortunately, it hit Siberia. Otherwise, basically, hit anywhere near like a popular area would have just destroyed everything. So, fly a bunch of trees out there. It took basically people years before they went out there to real to to find this to find this um, particular uh, site. Now, no crater has ever been found for this thing, so it's believed to have like, this meteors to explode above the ground. Okay. Let me see. A more famous example, uh, or more recent example, came more recently in 2013, when a much smaller object exploded high above a Russian city. So let's, let's look at that next. What exploded over Russia? Presented by Science at NASA. When the sun rose over Russia's Ural Mountains on Friday, February 15th, many residents of nearby Chelyabinsk already knew that a space rock was coming. Later that day, an asteroid named 2012 DA-14 would pass by Earth only 17,200 miles above Indonesia. There was no danger of a collision, NASA assured the public. Maybe that's why, when the morning sky lit up with a second sun and a shockwave shattered windows in hundreds of buildings around Chelyabinsk, only a few people picking themselves off the ground figured it out right away. This was not a crashing plane or a rocket attack. It was a meteor strike, the most powerful since the Tunguska event of 1908, says Bill Cook of NASA's Meteoroid Environment Office. In a one-in-a-million coincidence that still has NASA experts shaking their heads, a small asteroid completely unrelated to 2012 DA-14 struck Earth only hours before the publicized event. These are rare events, and it is incredible to see them happening on the same day says Paul Chodas of NASA's Near-Earth Object Program at JPL. Researchers have since pieced together what happened. 
The most telling information came from a network of infrasound sensors operated by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. Their purpose is to monitor nuclear explosions. Infrasound is a type of very low-frequency sound wave that only elephants, homing pigeons, and a few other animals can hear. It turns out that meteors entering Earth's atmosphere cause ripples of infrasound to spread through the air of our planet. By analyzing infrasound records, it is possible to learn how long a meteor was in the air, which direction it traveled, and how much energy it unleashed. The Russian meteor's infrasound signal was detected by multiple stations, including one in Alaska more than 6,500 kilometers from Chelyabinsk. Western Ontario professor of physics Peter Brown analyzed the data. The asteroid was about 17 meters in diameter and weighed approximately 10,000 metric tons, he reports. It struck Earth's atmosphere at 40,000 miles per hour and broke apart about 12 to 15 miles above Earth's surface. The energy of the resulting explosion exceeded 470 kilotons of TNT. For comparison, the first atomic bombs produced only 15 to 20 kilotons. Based on the trajectory of the fireball, analysts have also plotted its orbit. It originally came from the asteroid belt, about 2.5 times farther from the Sun than Earth, says Cook. Comparing the orbit of the Russian meteor to that of 2012 DA-14, NASA orbit analysts have shown that there is no connection between the two. These are independent objects, Cook says. The fact that they reached Earth on the same day, one just a little closer than the other, appears to be a complete coincidence. Infrasound records confirm that the meteor entered the atmosphere at a shallow angle of about 20 degrees and lasted more than 30 seconds before it exploded. The loud report, which was heard and felt for hundreds of miles, marked the beginning of a scientific scavenger hunt. Thousands of fragments of the meteor are now scattered across the Ural countryside, and a small fraction have already been found. Preliminary reports, mainly communicated through the media, suggest that the asteroid was made mostly of stone with a bit of iron. In other words, a typical asteroid from beyond the orbit of Mars, says Cook. There are millions more just like it. And that is something to think about as the cleanup in Chelyabinsk continues. For more news about things coming out of the blue, visit science.nasa.gov. All right, so let's talk about basically what happens with giant impacts. So there's Chelyabinsk. Um, it's actually not that uncommon. Uh, it turns out that um, roughly every decade to a century-ish or so, you're going to get basically a Chelyabinsk-like event. Uh, by comparison, basically, there's every every year roughly, there is an annual event of roughly about 20 kilos. This is about the same explosive power as the Hiroshima or Nagasaki bomb, the first nuclear weapon dropped on uh, used on Earth. Um, but most of the time, this happens over the ocean and high in the atmosphere, so we hardly notice. Chelyabinsk, events, this one actually happened like quite a few uh, Quite a, quite a bit up, like 12 miles to 50 miles above the surface of the Earth, but yet it was actually powerful enough to create a, um, a really loud bang, right? There's a Tunguska explosion, right? There, that is 10 megatons, right? Um, this one happened much closer to the ground, so as a result, basically, if it, its impact was much more um, um, uh, important. Now, if you keep going on, these uh, uh, impacts can get larger and larger until you get to get and so you get basically impacts that can occur roughly every few hundred thousand years or so, which are basically global catastrophes, right? So this is something like 10,000 megatons or so, which is something similar to all the nuclear weapons on Earth exploding all at once, all right? Uh, all the way basically up to basically extinction of dinosaur events, which are, which are uh, much, much larger, okay? So... Uh, giant, these giant impacts can cause mass extinction. So, uh, why accept the hypothesis for is that an impact of a 10 kilometer asteroid that hit the Earth 65 million years ago killed off all the dinosaurs, right? And part of the major evidence for this is actually later iridium at the boundary where the dinosaurs can be found. So, below the boundary, the dinosaurs are found, and above the boundary, the dinosaurs are not found, right? So, there's this iridium layer basically that exists, right? Iridium is a fairly uh, rare material on Earth, but very common on asteroids. So this iridium layer has been found basically um, worldwide around the time where the dinosaurs have died out. Okay. Also, basically, a crater of the right age and size has been found in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico called the Chicozupa Chica, uh, Crater. And this is actually found by measuring gravity. So you can actually measure how different Earth's gravity is at different points of a very sensitive gravity meter. And you can see, basically, in this region, there's a circular 
um, imprint of something that had uh, impacted a long, long time ago. All right. So such a uh, impact would have generated huge mega tsunamis in this region, but something like three kilometers high, about two miles high. All right. And this is seen in the fractured rock that are piles in the region around the impact site. So basically, southern United States, um, there's lots of evidence of fractured rocks in this region that resulted from basically a giant wave hitting it. The material that was thrown up from the impact uh, would re-enter Earth's atmosphere around the, around the world. So basically, it creates an explosion. And then all this explosion just shoots up all the material. And this material goes way up in the Earth's um, into orbit and falls back down again. Now, so much of the material falls back down that it basically heats up the upper, it starts to glow as they come back like a giant meteor shower. But imagine a meteor shower that has so many meteors coming back that it heats up the average temperature of the Earth to about 400 degrees, right? So worldwide, you trigger forest fires and also anything that's sitting in 400 degree heat for an hour will get baked, right? So it produces lots of dust and sulfates that will block out the sun for years and bathe the Earth as it rains. So this is this causes the death of many plant species and the death of many animals in the ocean. Okay, oh, these are life giant impacts and mass extinctions. They're not particularly um, huge, but they're not particularly small either, right? So you, you're, you, yes, you might get killed more likely killed by dogs or so, but not much, not much more likely, right? So like snakes, maybe double the probability, tornadoes, maybe triple the probability or so. All right, okay, but like you might have a yes, yeah, so you might have a better chance. You yeah, so. So asteroid impacts are not generally something you worry about. Of course, you got to worry about tsunamis and firework displays as well. Uh, to help understand the threat of earth crossing objects, we define all of them. So basically, there's lots of um, um, uh, there's some effort now to categorize all the near earth asteroids. I think that then and in that effort is mostly paid great dividends. It's found most of the near earth asteroids, which are really large and could cause basic extinction of humanity. But not all of them that can actually cause a major damage, right? So one such effort is the Catalina Sky Survey being run out of Arizona. So it uses a bunch of relatively small telescopes to look for near Earth asteroids. Okay, so basically you could see uh, there's one detection that have of a rocket actually hit the Earth. So this is 2008 TC3. So it was detected on October 6, 2008, 20 hours before impact. Okay, hit the Earth October 7, 2008 in northern Sudan. Right, explode a force very small, 2.1 kilotons, one fifth the size of an atomic bomb. This is something actually that should happen roughly about once a year. Most of the time, we don't notice it. The fractures were collected by geologists, so basically they found it. They sent basically um, some geologists into it, and then they found these um, uh, rocks, basically, which come from the asteroid as a result of that. Okay, so let's talk about how the solar system have has formed. So the first thing you gotta look at basic characteristics of the solar system. So all the planets are nearly in the plane. So they're basically nearly on the same flat surface to about 1%. They all orbit in the same direction. Counterclockwise view from the ecliptic, which is view from above Earth's North Pole, looking down, right? They all rotate in the same direction. The orbits all nearly circular. The planets are relatively isolated from each other, right? They don't, most planets don't cross each other. They stay, tend, they tend, tend to basically stay within their own zone. And the space between planets are, is relatively empty. All right? So how do we account for all these properties from their formation? All right? So there's one hypothesis known as the nebula hypothesis, which suggests that the planets form from a gas cloud, which collapsed into a disk. So this gas cloud will have the same composition as the sun, mainly hydrogen, helium, but trace of basically carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, ex iron, etc. Okay, so this nebula hypothesis basically um, was proposed by Laplace back in uh, the 18th century, right? But this was not the only idea. People have, have had lots of ideas basically for formation of planet. Okay, um, <clears throat> so one of the main issues with the nebula hypothesis is that most of the mass is in the sun, but most of the angular momentum, the spin, is in the planets, right? So people did propose other ideas. So one was a tidal model that, like, a passing star ripped material from the sun, and this material basically went in orbit around the sun, collapsed and formed the planets. There's a capture model, right? The sun and planets form separately, but the planets were later captured later by the sun. There's a creature model where uh, basically the sun moves through a gas cloud, it got some gas, and that gas actually fell and formed the planet, right? Um, 
But the nebula hypothesis eventually won out over all the competitors because many of the observations of disk around young stars seem to support it. Right? So the nebula hypothesis is basically saying the sun and the and the planets form at the same time from the same gas cloud, right? And basically what most of most of the mass ended up the sun, but basically formed a thin disk of, of, of gas which ended up forming the planets. Okay, so let's basically talk a little about formation of the sun. So remember, most of the mass of the solar system is in the sun. So formation of the solar system, the rest of the solar system, is a footnote in the formation of the sun. Okay, so let's recall that all stars form like their clouds. Okay, and when we have when these clouds can collapse, all right, or more of the course, they form a polar star and, in principle, a disk of gas that surrounds them. All right. Now, as this uh, gas collapses, as the cloud collapses, the angular momentum uh, of the gas picks up spin faster and faster until the gas moves fast enough to orbit the polar star in a thin disk. So this is a general principle of astronomy. If you collapse some stuff due to gravity, this leads to basically formation of this if there's any angular momentum around. Okay? So the way to think about this is that imagine you have an ice skater. Right? Ice skater basically puts her, her, her arms out it will spin slowly. If the ice skater pulls her arms in, she will rotate quickly, right? So this causes her to spin up. Examples of in action. Alright, so in fact, this is actually observed. This is why the nebula hypothesis won out. Right, so if you basically look at proto stars, here are some images of disk around proto stars. Right, so see, uh, this is a very clear image of this. There's another image of a disk there. There's suggestion of a disk there. Obvious suggestion of a disk everywhere. So the young stellar disk, basically found by Hubble Space Telescope. <coughs> now you look in Orion. Orion's a nebula there. You also see basically prominent disks in these regions <coughs> around young proto stars. Right? And some of them are even suggestive of the size of the actual our, our solar system as well. Uh, here are other examples of um, uh, protostars around uh, young stars. Some of them are much larger than the solar system. Some of them are basically about the same size. Well, this is much larger. <coughs> so the never hypothesis is that you have a spinning disk of gas and dust that orbits around the sun, and in that have dust grains. The dust grains start collecting with each other, into forming little, tiny rocks called planetesimal. The planetesimal themselves collect and collide and basically form into planets. Okay, so basically the planets that form from the disk begins by condensing out of the dust and gas into this. So the same way the raindrops form basically. So you start with a seed. So a lot of times you have a little seed of dust or whatnot in the air. The water will collect around the drop until it becomes so heavy it falls. Right? So similarly, planets form by starting to see and collecting more and more material at, around them. Okay? Uh, you see this basically around your house as well. Okay? Um, gas is not condensed because of gas, but dust can gather. Right? So for instance, everyone has, if you go around your house, basically you will find there are regions where you get these dust bunnies. Right? So for instance, here's a dust bunny eating, eating carrot, for instance. Right? Um, you will notice that most of these um, things happen near ledges or near edges. And that's because it turns out that air flow around there is the commonest there. And so basically dust that ends up in those areas tend to gather in those areas. And as they gather, they can basically just, just tiny motions of the air molecule will cause these dust particles to collide. And basically this collision of dust particles sometimes causes them to stick and they basically will form uh, dust bunny like structures. So dust bunnies or dust coagulation, right, are stuck together by molecular forces, right? So for instance, you have basically here's one dust particle here, you get another dust particle comes by, ends up sticking to it, another dust particle ends up coming by, sticks to it, and then yeah, another basically this four plane sticks to, to another one, right? So the small grains will stick to make larger grains, which in turn stick to make even larger grains. Right? So basically goes from n equals one, two, four, double again, and double again eight. Right? So the grains that are produced, all right, uh, tend to be very large, right, and or mostly fill empty space. So this is like the size of the dust grain. Most of the dust here is basically just empty space here. Okay. So here's an example of interplanetary dust grain. This is collected from a comet from the Stardust mission. So this is basically interplanetary dust bunny. Right. So 
the building blocks for planets are asteroid-sized bodies, right? So as the dust bunnies get bigger and bigger, these planet, the, um, what happens is that gravity takes over. Basically, the dust bunnies themselves have some gravity and start pulling all the dust bunnies together, right? So eventually, gravity is so strong that that basically it's enough to attract and hold the gravity together um, with gravity, and molecular forces are no longer necessary. So this process of gathering material via gravity is a process known as accretion, right? So eventually these planets grow, planets grow so large they gather other all the other ones, right? So this is an example of rich get richer, right? So these planets start attracting other big planets until basically all the material in the nearby bodies, all right, gets concentrated in basically one large body. So these large are called polar planets, right? And this is generally thought how the terrestrial planets uh, Mercury, Venus, uh, Earth, and Mars were formed. Okay, so basically, the Sun keeps gas from condensing into ice around the inner solar system, so it means hot gas. The dust grains grow by gathering together. The dust bunnies gather to form planetesimal. Planetesimal gather to form polar planets. The heat of formation, basically from all this uh, forming or impacting of polar planets, melts the polar planets. And as a result of this, basically now it becomes liquid, you can basically have the heavy stuff sink to the bottom, right? So iron sinks to the bottom uh, to form a core. This is known as differentiation, okay? So the formation of these planets generate a lot of heat. So this basically allows the planet to differentiate. Metals sink to the bottom of the core and, ma and lighter materials such as rocks float to the top. So that's why you have metallic cores with rocky mantles. Um, some of these events, some of these accretion events can be pretty huge. In fact, one of the accretion events is thought like to have formed the moon, right? So, in fact, um, one of these large events basically is thought to be responsible for the formation of the moon. So what happened in that case was that basically around the young Earth, a Mars-sized body smacked into the young Earth, right? And threw out all this material. And this material basically went in orbit around the young Earth and eventually condensed to create the, the moon as we see it today. All right, here's a computer simulation event. There's impact, all the material is flying around it. <coughs> and you can see basically, um, I'm not sure this is going to show it. I guess not. All right, so uh, eventually all this material around here will be gathered into one of these. Um, uh, dense pockets here, and they'll basically gather all the material to form a moon. Okay, uh, so up to this point, our story has just produced rocky bodies for the terrestrial planets, but the Jovian planets are gaseous, so they're going to be formed a little differently. So to form the Jovian planets, you need one more stage of planet formation where the gas accretes onto rocky cores. <coughs> but to accrete gas, you need a big, big core. Right? So how do you get the big, big core? Okay, well. Bigger core is only possible if you can gather more material, okay? And in order to basically gather more material, you just can't gather rocks, you have to gather ices, right? So you can only form the stuff in areas where the gas is cold enough that ices can form, which is called a snow line, right? So you get this extra stuff. And so basically, the snow line has to be um, uh, outside of basically inner parts of, the, um, of, of any forming um, solar system, okay? So it turns out that in the early solar system, the snow line was roughly at the position of Jupiter today. All right. So what happens basically you have in the inner regions you have rocky cores, right? Outside the frost line, you can accrete plants with rocks and ice. And the extra benefit of ice allows it to form much larger cores. Okay. So this extra phase of accretion is depends on the position of snow line it explains why you have rocky plants close to the sun and gaseous planets further away from the sun. Right. So the accretion of gas on the Jovian planet produces a disk. Right? This is the raw material for later formation of moons around it. Right? So basically you get mini disks around these objects. And these mini disks will form their own little miniature solar systems, right? like around Jupiter, for instance, or Saturn. All right. <coughs> now, planet formation can't last forever. Eventually, the planet form building has to stop because the young protostar will blow out all the gas in the in in the in the disk, right? And there are two ways of doing it. Uh, one way is that stars have magnetic fields. This magnetic field can eventually push this stuff out. And the other way is basically you stars also emit light, and this light basically will eventually full evaporate 
or evaporate or hist or evaporate basically the, the the material that forms planets. Okay, and we see this in action from observation of the young polar stars. So, for instance, you see basically these are polar stars with their respective ages: one mega year, ten mega year, hundred mega years, what giga year or so. And what happens is that the fractions observed with this rapidly decline until roughly about maybe twenty mega years or so. None of these objects have disk anymore. So if you're younger than that, you do see this, though, uh, though it gets rarer and rarer. But once you pass about 20 mega years, you'll never see any disk around these objects anymore. So <clears throat> now I want to talk about one more thing, scattering ejection. So the early solar system was filled with debris that was ejected by plants, the main culprit being Jupiter. Okay, And this scattering of planetesimals between planets allows them to change their orbits. So generally, basically, Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn move outward at the expense of Jupiter, which move inward. So Jupiter basically ejects stuff outward, and that stuff basically ends up pushing Neptune and Uranus out. Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn outward. Um, so basically, Jupiter being baddest boy in block tends to fling stuff out of the solar system, so it moves inward, while the other three tend to move planetesimal inward, so they move outward. Okay. So here's an example of Neptune. Basically, this is the... Uh, distance that it travels, this is the orbit, orbital separation. So it went from basically 24 astronomical units all the way out to maybe 30-ish um, astronomical units, depending on basically the structure of the outer um, uh, distribution of planetesimals, right, in about 50 mega years. All right, so it substantially changed its position by about 33% just to, due to the ejection of planetesimals. All right, so let's talk about the nebula hypothesis and the solar system. So planets form a disk that rotates in the same directions. Planets are nor nearly in plane to 1%. The orbits are all in the same direction, and the orbits are nearly circular. The planets are relatively isolated. All right. Uh, so because planets form a disk, it explains those properties. The planets are relatively isolated because planets accrete all the material from the neighboring orbits. Uh, planet makeup and composition differ. Well, that's because of the presence of a snow line allows different materials to condense into forming polar planets. And planets scatter small bodies, which basically empties out all the space between planets. Okay. 